everyone. Welcome to Church Online. You know, a little over a decade ago, I remember being home with my sons and seeing Janelle, my wife, pull into the driveway. And she was coming back from Bible study and she walked in and said, I got $5. And being very excited myself, I said, how? And she replied, Debbie gave it to me. She was at Bible study and she felt the Lord wanted me to have it. And a huge sense of gratitude filled our hearts. Now, you might be thinking, did he just say $5? And if he did, why, why is he so happy about that? I mean, it's $5. I know if I gave my, my Glastonbury raised kids $5, they would scoff at me. They'd be like, Dad, what am I supposed to do with this? And I get it because $5 isn't much. So what's the big deal about $5? Well, for us, earlier that day, Janelle and I had been searching the entire house for any money. Junk drawers, pockets, couch cushions. And the reason being is that we didn't have any food in the house. And after searching everywhere, we did not find much. But when Debbie gave us $5, it was like manna from heaven. We could eat that day and we were thankful. You know, I want to add another detail to that story. You know, we, we didn't have much money at that time, but you know who had even less money? Debbie. She was probably the poorest person in our church, and I wouldn't have been surprised if that was her last $5. Knowing that, I still consider that probably the most generous gift I've ever received because she likely gave everything. It really reminds me of what we read in Luke chapter 21, where it says, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting in their gifts in the offering box, and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. There are a few lessons that we could learn from this passage, but one lesson is generosity. And that generosity isn't always about how much money, but how much faith. That is, how much are you willing to give to the Lord? How much do you trust God? And in this story, and with Debbie, they gave everything because they loved and trusted God. They were generous. And today I am adding a bonus message to our recalibration series because I believe God impressed on my heart to speak on this topic of generosity because a spiritually mature church, something that we desire to be in this year, is a generous church. We see this in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Going on to Acts chapter 4, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostle Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. The early church was a generous church. They were willing to give everything to the Lord. And the question for us today is, are we generous? Are we a generous church? Are we willing to give the Lord everything? Don't worry, I'm not going to ask any of you to sell your property and write a check to the, the River Church. Now, if the Lord puts that on your heart, that's a different conversation. But I'm, I'm not going to do that. But before I begin... Let me be clear about a few things. 
Number one, when we talk about generosity, we're not doing so because God needs your money. God is not broke. He owns everything. The prophet Haggai reminds us that God said, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. God does not ask us to be generous because he is in need. Number two, I'm not talking about it today because the River Church needs your money. I didn't add this sermon because we can't pay our bills. God is our provider. And I have always found the Apostle Paul's words to be true, where he says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now, I, I got to be careful when I say the River Church doesn't need your money. I'm not saying stop your financial giving because God uses your financial giving to provide for our needs. There is no mothership financing the work that's happening here in Glastonbury. We are entirely supported by your generosity. And one reason that I can say that the River Church does not need your money is because the River Church is a generous church. All right, number three, the reason we are talking about giving is because spiritually mature people are generous people. And if we are not generous, then we need to recalibrate because Jesus wants his people to be a generous people. And if we are generous, well, we need to keep being generous and maybe even grow in our generosity. And so let's talk about generosity. We know that Jesus cares about it. We know it involves giving the Lord everything, but what else do we know? Well, Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines generous as being liberal in giving, marked by abundance or ample proportions, characterized by a noble or kindly spirit. I think that's helpful, but let's focus specifically on the biblical generosity we see in the scriptures. The generosity that we will discuss today is the giving of your resources, that is your time, talent, and money, as unto the Lord. You know, the greatest example of generosity is what we see when God gives, when God gave his son Jesus to us. Consider the following. Philippians 2 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Paul writes, You guys need to stop being selfish. Care about one another. Instead, be generous. Verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. In other words, Jesus is God, and as God, he has everything. Yet, because he is generous, he emptied himself by taking the form of a, of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus gave everything so that we could have everything when we deserved nothing. 2 Corinthians 8 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. That is generosity. God is generous, and he wants us, his people, to be generous too. So how can we become generous people? And so first off, sometimes becoming generous is simply operating in your giftedness. Now in the church, when we talk about giftings, I think it's helpful to consider them in two categories. Number one are natural giftings. That is the, the ways that God has naturally gifted us or the things that we are naturally good at. And number two are spiritual gifts, things that the Holy Spirit empowers us to be good at. You know, when we turn from our sin and put our faith in Jesus, the Bible says that we are filled with the Holy Spirit and he gives us gifts. He gives us new abilities to accomplish the work he calls us to. And we're going to talk more about that over the next few weeks when we begin our Gifts of the Spirit series. But the way that I understand spiritual gifts is sometimes the Holy Spirit gifts us 
in ways that supercharge our natural gifts. For example, I have always felt that I had a natural gift for learning. School was always easy for me. But I believe one of my spiritual gifts is teaching. And my natural gift of learning and my spiritual gift of teaching work together in amplified ways. However, sometimes spiritual gifts give us the ability to do things that we would never do. Where it becomes clear that God is working in the person. For example, I'm an introvert. And if you've ever hung out with me outside of church, you probably have noticed that I am quiet and awkward. But God has given me spiritual gifts that allow me to preach God's word. And many hear me speak on Sundays when they have seen me outside of church and they hear me speak on Sundays and they're like, who is that talking? So when it comes to generosity, Sometimes we just need to do it. We just need to use our gifts. Romans 12 says the same thing. It says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. And if it is giving, give generously. If you want to become generous, then you need to practice generosity, whether it's easy or not. You need, just need to, to do it. Now you might be asking, okay, so what if I'm not naturally or spiritually gifted in generosity? Am I off the hook? No. Because even if you're not gifted, generosity is something that can and must be cultivated. Now, to cultivate means to prepare, acquire, or develop. And I see three ways to biblically cultivate generosity. And the first way is by teaching. We see generosity or giving taught in the Old Testament through the concept of the tithe. Now, that is a complex concept, but essentially it was the giving of the 10% of your first fruits. That is your, your resources and your income to the Lord. And it was taught and practiced by the people of God, by the Israelites, throughout the first half of the Bible. Now, some have concluded that this changed in the New Testament, that tithing is, is no longer binding on the church. Rather, the people of God are now to give as the Lord puts on their heart. For example, we're in 2 Corinthians, it says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, I got to admit, I agree with that. However, I still think that tithing is a good practice. And for the most part, I personally use the principle of tithing to guide my giving. Regardless of where you stand, here's another important lesson that needs to be considered. In the New Testament, Jesus always elevated the standard. Now, in the Old Testament, what was taught was... Don't look at a person with lust or don't hate a person. But when Jesus came on the scene, he elevated the standard. He said, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And the apostle John, a follower of Jesus, building on things that Jesus taught him, said everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Therefore, I believe it's reasonable to conclude that when it comes to giving, God's standard did not go down when it was from the Old Testament to the New Testament, but it also elevated. And I believe the fact that we see the early church in the book of Acts giving everything, they were giving more than 10%, supports this. Now, the second way we can cultivate generosity is by modeling. We often learn by watching others. Early on, the Jerusalem church was facing hardships and they needed help. The Corinthian church initially offered to help, but then they struggled to follow through. And so Paul wrote the following. Now, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. 
They are being tested by many troubles and they are very poor, but they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us just as God wanted them to do. To help the Corinthians grow in generosity, Paul pointed to the example of the Macedonian churches who modeled generosity. And we learn generosity by watching others too. And I think some of the examples of generosity uh, that we've already discussed can be helpful for us. I mean, think about how, how it worked out in some of the things we've, we've talked about. In the Old Testament, so we talked about the Old Testament taught and practiced generosity. And then Jesus celebrated the generosity uh, modeled by the poor widow who was probably doing it because she was taught by what was uh, taught in the Old Testament. Then the disciples learned this lesson that Jesus taught to them, and then they went on to practice generosity in Acts chapter 2. And the generosity modeled in Acts chapter 2 likely influenced the generosity that we read about in Acts chapter 4. And what was modeled in Acts chapter 4 possibly influenced the generosity found in the Macedonian churches. And the biblical generosity modeled and recorded in Scripture likely impacted my friend Debbie's generosity. When giving is modeled, generosity is cultivated. All right, finally, the third way to cultivate generosity is to be challenged. You know, the prophet Malachi wrote, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there may be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's army, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. In other words, God is like, I challenge you. Put me to the test. Challenging people, especially to give, can be uncomfortable. But as we just read, it is both biblical and effective. You know, I, I recently did this with two people in our church, and both were super awkward conversations, but they needed to happen. And both the people I spoke to responded to the challenge. And when they did, they experienced the Lord's blessing and they grew in generosity. You know, a challenge is a fertile field to cultivate generosity. And that's why Jesus challenged his disciples by saying, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, the third way that we can become generous is to be intentionally generous. You know, when I say intentional, I'm considering two things. First, we can be intentionally generous as a response of worship. I'm giving intentionally because I love Jesus. I worship him. And, and, and this next point, I just, I just want to say this next point is going to be an opportunity for us to see that generosity isn't just about money. Generosity involves the giving of your life as an act of worship to the Lord. And so in Acts chapter 18, Paul travels to the city of Corinth to tell people about Jesus. And he meets a husband and wife by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. And Paul worked, lived with them and worked with them for they were tent makers just as he was. And then verse 9 goes on to say, One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, Don't be afraid, speak out, don't be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack and harm you, for many people in this city belong to me. I love that. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half teaching the word of God. Now, the reason why God said this to Paul is because Paul at this time was essentially being hunted for preaching the gospel. People were out to get him. Now, I want to add this. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, when, was I wrong when I humbled myself and honored you by preaching God's 
gospel to you without expecting anything in return? I robbed other churches by accepting their contributions so I could serve you at no cost. And when I was with you and didn't have enough to live on, I did not become a financial burden to anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia brought me all that I needed. I have never been a burden to you, and I never will be. Let me, let me put all this together, all the things I just read together. And so Paul, he generously gave everything. He risked his life to preach the gospel in an act of worship to the Lord. But Paul also worked to support himself as a tent maker, as a way to be generous to the Corinthian church. And so for, for this time, all of his ministry was on a volunteer basis. And again, he did it as an act of worship to God. Now, I just want to point this out, that, that, that many of you who, who serve at the River Church, many, many of you have a full-time job, and yet you faithfully serve at a high level as a volunteer. Do you know what that is? That is being intentionally generous. You are in being intentional with your generosity because you love Jesus, just like Paul here. How cool is that? So generosity doesn't require your money. That being said, your generosity will include your money. And this is because money has this special ability to attach to and govern our hearts. In other words, it is really easy for money to become our master. And when that happens... We'll never be generous. But Jesus wants us to be generous. That's why he said, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one or love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, one way to grow in generosity is to intentionally give away our money. Now, that doesn't mean that God wants us to be reckless with our money. We are to be good stewards, but God wants us to give our money away strategically. And in Acts chapter 16, Paul meets a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, and she was a worshiper of God. Then the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what Paul was saying. What I want us to notice about what we just read is that she was a seller of purple goods. In other words, she was rich. She was a good businesswoman. She probably had a big house because she was strategic with her money. And then the story continues. And then Lydia, after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. What we discover is that she was rich, but she was also very generous. And while I believe she was naturally gifted in generosity, I also think her lifestyle allowed her to be generous. Here's what I want us to consider. In order to be generous, you need to get your finances in order like Lydia. And one way to do that is to responsibly budget so that you can strategically give. Paul told the Corinthians this. He said, now regarding your question about the money collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. On the first day of the week, you should each put aside a portion of money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. Budgeting is biblical. And I also want us to notice how Paul referenced the first day of the week. I believe there is a connection there to the idea of tithing or giving of your first fruits. Because if if you don't strategically set money aside to give away so that you can develop a heart of generosity, what you're going to find happens is that you're not going to end up giving. And even if you do, even if you do, you'll end up giving what's left over. And do you really want to give God your leftovers? Now, I want to give a few encouragements about giving. 
First off, I want to encourage you to give sacrificially. As you strategically decide what to give, pray about it, be cheerful about it, but then realize that your generosity comes with a sacrifice. It's very similar to what King David understood when he said, I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. Our generosity should be sacrificial. Now, the second thing I want to encourage you about is that when you give, trust God, not math. That's, that might sound odd, but let me explain. Something special happens, something supernatural happens when we live generously, especially when we're giving money to the Lord. Now, for many of us, we know that math is a very reliable thing, and in the natural world, it is. But the truth is, math is not Lord. It's not the final word. And the Lord of all creation, what he can do is he can start making supernatural things happen with numbers. And when we start trusting God with our money, we then enter into God's supernatural economy. And those of us, some of us know this, those of us who, who, who have faith to enter into the supernatural economy usually experience two things. Number one, we, we know that God can stretch our dollar. You know, before we were giving, this is what happened. We would pay our bills and then we had no, no money left over. And then we start giving by faith. And then we pay our bills and then something supernatural happens. We all of a sudden have money left over and we're like, how? The math doesn't make sense. We got the same paycheck. We got the same bills. Why is there more money? Why is there money left over? Because that's what happens in God's supernatural economy. Furthermore, what we will find is that God trusts generous people with even more money. Now, the principle that I'm about to share sometimes makes some of us scared or nervous because there have been many who have abused this principle in Jesus' name, which is wrong. But the fact that people do that thing wrong doesn't make the truth of God's biblical principle wrong. And here's that true principle. Here's the truth. God blesses those who give. 2 Corinthians says, this is the point. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Just as we need to be strategic in getting our finances in order so that we can be generous, at the same time, we may need to give so that we can get our finances in order. Because it's God's blessings that is going to make us generous. And I know that seems like a paradox, but that's just, that's just the mystery of God's supernatural economy. If you will use your gift of generosity, if you will cultivate it, if you will be strategic about your giving, you're going to have some fun. No joke. You are going to become a cheerful giver. More than that, you will grow in your spiritual maturity because you will be caring about the things that Christ cares about. And Jesus is going to bless you because he cares about his people being generous. And so as we close, let me ask again, are we a generous people? And if not, we may need to recalibrate. We need, may need to start being generous by giving of our resources, our time, talent, and money. And so what do you need to do today to start practicing generosity? But maybe today you are a generous person, and then let me encourage you, don't stop. In fact, keep growing. Keep maturing in this area. Your generosity brings joy. It teaches others to be generous. And as worship, it blesses your heavenly Father because it shows your devotion to him. Therefore, let me ask you, what do you need to do to keep 
growing in your generosity. Finally, we can't be biblically generous apart from the Holy Spirit's power. And so today, if you want to be generous, but you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, what you need to do is you need to turn from your sin. You need to repent and put your faith in Jesus. And when you do, God promises that not only will you be forgiven for your sin, but you will receive eternal life and you will be filled with the Holy Spirit's power so that you can be generous. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your generosity. It's because you gave your son Jesus that we now have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And now because we love you, we ask by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would make us generous. Help us to use our gifts. Help us to cultivate generosity. Help us to be intentional about it. And may our generosity further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.